So I'd like you to welcome you to Queer Thinking, the Trans and Gender Diverse Community Voices Forum. What we'll be doing today is we'll have a presentation on transition. That'll be followed by a presentation on lateral hostility. Then there'll be a series of speakers speaking around resilience. Finally, we'll have a panel discussion on a number of hot topics for the trans and gender diverse community. Elizabeth Riley will be hosting, hosting us this afternoon. Elizabeth is a specialist counsellor with a PhD in the needs of gender variant children and their parents. Could you all put your hands together for Elizabeth Riley? Thank you, Caitlin, and welcome everybody to this wonderful afternoon that we've got happening here today. Look, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker for, to, for this afternoon is Jasmine Newenhouse. She's a member of the CRMT Advisory Committee. She's from Brisbane, and she's spoken in many forms about the success of her transition. And what she's going to present for us now is transition. What a ride. Please welcome Jasmine. Members of the LGBTI community and our allies in attendance, it is an amazing opportunity for me to speak with you and being such a wonderful and diverse group of individuals. As mentioned, my name is Jasmine, and I've been a member and friend of the CRMT for quite some time now. I've been asked to speak with you today to share my background and discuss how I've negotiated the turbulence of transition to reach a happy and confident state of self. I hope to help people see transition in a more positive light and to see it as a journey of possibilities rather than just a minefield of hurdles and challenges. But before I talk about my transition, I think a bit of a backstory of my life will help you understand the mindset in which I tackled it. I knew I was different from a very young age. When I was young, I used to love Disney, but I always wanted to be the princess. In grade five, I realised that boys were supposed to want to be the knight in shining armour, and that's when I realised I wasn't a boy. I instinctively knew this wasn't a good realisation as I had a brother and two stepbrothers who perfectly emulated what a boy was supposed to be. But I used that to my advantage. I mimicked them. I didn't want to do what they did, but I knew that that's how boys behaved. So I learnt what to do and I played along. These lessons were of tremendous value in my life, especially when I was forced to go to an all-boys school, which for me was hell. I was a high achiever at school but I flew under the radar. I did enough to be liked by the teachers, accepted by the bullies, befriended by the misfits, but not to become popular because I was an intruder in this boy's world and I was scared of tripping up. But gender dysphoria, it wasn't my only issue as a child. I regularly endured alcohol-fueled fighting behind closed doors at home, which was contrasted by my need to constantly portray the perfect family image to the world outside our family. My only real saving grace was my grandmother. She was an amazing woman who I spent most of my holidays with and it was a great opportunity for me to escape the drama of my life. But the bottom line is that I was miserable on so many levels and I couldn't talk to anyone about the details. I eventually came to tell my parents that I was gay as a half-truth, the reality being that I was attracted to men. I thought it would test the waters and it didn't turn out too well for me. It served as evidence that I needed to keep hiding the truth. At 14 years old and after a horrible fight with puberty and the horrors that that was for me, and dealing with intense anxiety and depression, I was put on my first ever script of antidepressants. I started to rebel against my parents and the constant fighting at home, and eventually they offloaded me to my biological father, who as well wasn't comfortable with his gay son or his gay son's gay friends, and eventually I ended up joining the ranks of the kids on the streets of Brisbane. 
Well, only a matter of a few months on the street, I can tell you I experienced things no one should have to endure, let alone a 15-year-old girl who had to masquerade as a tough gay boy. As a 15-year-old, I'd experienced domestic violence. I'd been raped. I'd survived hate crimes. I was witness to the death of a friend. And I had to fight people for the right to sleep on the park bench that I liked because it was surrounded by trees and I could hear water, which kept me calm during the night. I was introduced to drugs and I had to steal food to survive. And as a member of Homeless Youth Troop, I was scared constantly. I saw countless people going down the rabbit hole and I didn't want to join them and I knew that it was time to thrive or die. So I started searching for people who could help me. I got the right advice. I heeded the right advice. I went through a ton of counselling. And before I turned 16, I had my Cert 3 in business from TAFE. Through community group support and much counselling, I learned the skills of setting reasonable expectations, aiming for goals, identifying opportunities even in times of distress, and both asking for and accepting help. I used these skills over the following years to build a career which ran through events and administration coordination, further study in finance. I eventually went into recruitment. I did uh, administration and client management for financial services. And I ended up as a state training manager in an international financial product manufacturer and financial services provider. <laughs> In the 10 years following my initial introduction to the streets of Brisbane, I achieved a lot. And my reflection on the past made me realise that the concept of a dark horse was alive and well, and I was one of them. It made me realise that it doesn't matter where you start or how little seems possible at the starting line, with the right advice and the right attitude, we can all make and achieve successful goals. Anyway, here I was, a 25-year-old, and I had phoenixed a good quality life from the ashes of a broken childhood. But the most surprising achievement was the fact that in that whole time, I managed to perfectly conceal my real identity from everyone in my life. You see, I'd found a way to be accepted as a gay man. I even managed to reconnect with my family despite my sexuality controversy. And I thought to myself, Steve, you have a shot at romance, a happy life, an adventurous life. It's not worth risking it. Don't tell anyone you're a woman. And that was a thought process I carried for years. But the inauthenticity was excruciating for me. And as the years went by, my family, my friends and my partners could not understand how I was achieving so much and having such an exciting life full of adventure while maintaining such a horrible level of misery that manifested in self-harm and even a suicide attempt that left me with permanent memory problems. No matter how amazing my life was on paper, it was just fake and I felt imprisoned in a lie. My deepest desire was simply a life that I could experience as myself, and I desperately wanted people to know me, but not a single person in the world did. Then it happened, my trigger moment. The moment that resulted in my final decision to transition. See, I was on a business trip from Brisbane here in Sydney, and I'd been up since 3.30 to catch my flight, done a day of conferencing, a dinner with my colleagues, and I was out having a couple of drinks with them. I was tired, and it was time to go back to my hotel room. And I walked back alone. Faggot! I never saw the punch coming. And while lying on the ground, no one offered to help. That one act changed my life. I mean, I'm actually thankful for it. You see, it destroyed me completely to begin with. And I slipped into a horrible, deep depression that made every day feel more impossible than ever. But over time, I grew courage that I never knew I had, and I came to the conclusion that if I was going to be persecuted for pretending to be a gay guy, I may as well grab the opportunity to be the real me, and at least the insults will be accurate. <laughs> and that is when I came out for the second time. My transition was about to begin, but I was scared. I was terrified. I had no idea what transition meant. I had no idea what to do. My first step of this terrifyingly liberating experience was explaining to my partner and my inner circle that I was a woman. The thought that people that you love and hold dear could possibly leave you because of who you are is emotionally debilitating, and this was the second time I had to go through that fear.
Many tears and panic attacks later and finally I'd come out to a few more people and I had a partner who was willing to say, let's give it a try and a circle of friends willing to stand behind me. With a few people aware of the real me, I started buying makeup and women's clothes and I started hitting the midweek gay scene for some judgment free time as me. And when you've spent your whole life as someone else, it's amazing how addictive being yourself actually becomes. Once I'd had that taste of being myself, pretending to be Steve got harder by the day. And that's when I realised I needed some more advanced guidance. After a discussion with my gay GP, I got a number, of, a number and a referral from a psych, for a psychologist with experience involving gender identity. I must have stared at that phone number for about 10 minutes before I finally hit dial. Because you see, what I was staring at was a reality that I was about to be diagnosed with a mental disorder when there was nothing wrong with my brain, only something wrong with my body. But I pushed through the fear and I booked the appointment. Fast forward to the waiting room of my psychologist and I was shaking like a cold chihuahua. Then I got called into his office and I sat on the confession couch with no idea what to say. So he asked me, how are you feeling right now? And I took a deep breath and realised that I didn't have to focus on anything other than that exact moment and the reality was that I was more scared than a calorie on The Biggest Loser. <laughs> the conversation continued and gradually I became more comfortable when I realised that this was the right psychologist for me. We gelled, we clicked and we could talk openly. Sensing I'd relaxed, he began to ask the big questions and I was finally ready to talk about the real reason I was there. From that moment on, he played a massive role in the stability of my transition. He helped me navigate through false epiphanies. He helped me plan emotionally for the hurdles ahead. He helped me identify hurdles I hadn't even considered. And he armed me with the knowledge and support to be prepared and rational throughout the journey. And I will always be immeasurably thankful to him. Through our discussions, I came up with the transition matrix, components of transition broken down into segments that I could plan for, manage and monitor so that it wasn't such an overwhelming process. And those pieces were relationship transition, family and friends being a social transition, my work transition, my community transition, my legal transition and my medical transition. It really is that complicated. As I mentioned before, my relationship transition had a positive beginning, but the reality was we were only trying to see how being a straight couple would work and we had no promises other than honesty. Every now and then we did a temperature check on our relationship and eventually we accepted that the romance temperature had gone cold. Our love had remained strong and our dedication to each other was unwavering, but while I was changing into a woman in front of his eyes, his emotional attachment to me changed. And when we were intimate, his physical touch to me, treating me as a man was not what I wanted anymore. I longed for the touch of a man who saw me and treated me as a woman. With tears in our eyes, my partner and I turned friends, grabbed two glasses and a bottle of Sauv Blanc, and we prepared ourselves for the next step in our friendship. And as sad and confusing and conflicting as it was, today we still see each other as great friends every week, and he still gets along with my straight partner who I've now been with for three years. I dared to dream that finding love again would be possible after, instead of holding an impractical love captive. And through the right decisions, my dream came true. And I am finally in love with someone who is in love with the real me. Social transition with my family um, was quite confronting and volatile. And my circle of friends and chosen family were mostly open-minded, so it did become a bit easier. But there were, however, some friends who didn't find it quite so easy. I'll never forget one friend turning around to me and referring to it as intellectual suicide. It was difficult. But enter my psychologist to the rescue saying, don't take it personally. It wasn't personal. They were simply asking for time to digest the news. They needed time to change their gender and sex-related concepts so that they, that they had known their whole lives. I had unwillingly, unknowingly, made their truth untrue. Over time, we found our way back to our genuine friendship, love each other just as much as we always did, and it was because of patience and understanding. The biological family part of the social transition was unfortunately not the same story. I have not seen my brother since 2010. I have not seen my, step my father or my stepmother since 2011, or my extended family. My relationship with my mother is good, though strange, because her partner thinks that I'm nothing but a horrible abomination. But the good news is that my awesome grandmother and I are still best friends. Then there was work transition. Do I get a new job? Do I find another role in the same company? Do I transition on the job? To me, the easiest thing would have been finding a new job and starting afresh, but I'm stubborn to a fault. 
and I was not about to throw a position away that I'd worked so long and hard to get. Working with my manager, HR, and a group called Pride and Diversity, we planned a communication strategy for my internal colleagues, one for my external clients, and we've planned the logistics piece. The message was simple. One, I'm the same person doing the same job. In the same way, nothing changes. Two, I am open to rational questions and would rather you ask me something to my face and behind, talk about it behind my back. Three, gossiping behind my back is not appropriate. Four, people who have not met me before do not need to be told or warned about me. Five, it's okay to accidentally misgender me or use my old name through the process, but the effort must be in place to make sure that stops as soon as possible. And six, discrimination is not tolerated by our company policy, nor is it tolerated by the law. It was that simple. And you know what? They got it. I'll never forget when one of my best colleagues came up to me and said, you know what? Like, I've been sitting in this room surround, surrounded by people that I work with while they're told this news. And he walked up to me and he said, you were never gay. And I was like, oh, my God, the penny drops. But there were some setbacks. There were some people who weren't comfortable and voiced their concern and hatred of the idea that I was allowed to transition. There were external customers who refused to work with me, and there were a number of occasions where I was intentionally misgendered. But some reaction coaching with my psych, and I was able to continue my mantra of don't take it personally, and I let some of that stuff just slide. In the end, the people who didn't approve were the ones who were isolated, not me, because I was the one being positive and rational. The best part about my workplace transition, though, was while a lot of people thought that I only kept my job because it was a legal requirement, two years after I returned as a woman, I got told I should apply for a promoted position, and I got it, and I'm now a business development manager for a major international organisation, and for that I am absolutely proud. Yeah! Now, my community transition did not first seem overly important, but I started to realise just how large it was. My local fuel service station, pharmacy, grocer, butcher, newsagent and barista all saw me changing and all needed to eventually be told my name and the origins of that changed name. I had to learn how to work in public and be in public as a different gender, but unfortunately some people did not want to agree with that gender. An example, freaks like you belong in a circus doing my grocery shopping, and some crazy lady decided that was appropriate to yell in my face. But I was prepared this time. It cut like a knife, and I was so embarrassed I wanted to dis disappear into thin air. But I remembered, don't take it personally, and instead I looked around and no one was looking at me. They were looking at her. They thought that her behaviour was more inappropriate than my presence, and that gave me strength and confidence. Similar things had happened before and every time I'd run away. This was the first time I'd held my head high and it was the first of many. After learning that there really is a lot of silent support out there of people who just don't really care, I slowly let go of fear and, people th and of what people thought. That led to me walking around with an air of confidence as opposed to an air of vulnerability. And that is when most people stopped seeing me as someone trying to hide something and just saw me out of the corner of the eye as another woman walking down the street. Something that ultimately helped my community transition was in fact my legal transition. In truth, it's really hard to be yourself and be confident when you are stuck with legal documents that say otherwise. It's amazing how positively my life was affected by receiving a piece of paper that said my name is now legally Jasmine Isabella. Names chosen for myself from the amazingly independent Jasmine out of Disney's, Disney's Aladdin and the beautiful, courageous Belle from Disney's Beauty and the Beast, two characters who helped me discover and define who I am as a woman. My name had so much meaning to me now that it was legal that I was even more confident giving it out and responding to it. And in addition, if I was ever asked for ID, having gone through the process to get a female driver's licence and passport, my true name um, was on that ID, my true gender was on that ID, and I was much more proud to hand it over. I felt validated. It's amazing. When someone insults me and they're legally wrong, it's much easier to ignore. <laughs> Lastly, and most personally, there's medical transition. Now, for me, that was about HRT, SRS, and a couple of cosmetic surgeries. HRT was my first medical step, and it affected me far more strongly than I imagined. The emotional gymnastics, the physical changes, and the horrible side effects from lethargy to bitchiness. But I asked for some lenience from my friends and colleagues in return for holding myself accountable for my own mood. And as the side effects wore off and I got used to it, life continued in a very positive way. 
As for SRS and my other surgeries, I was very glad for the guidance of my psychologist and psychiatrist in preparation for this intense part of my journey. Even with years, a great, even with years of therapy and a great support network, I was not fully prepared for the mental strain I was going to go through around the time of my surgeries. The unprecedented combination of trepidation and elation threw me around quite a lot, but I managed to get through because I'd planned prepared as much as possible. I found my true physical self at the end of a very long, very dark tunnel, and I could not have done it alone. I was 27 years old when I saw my body for the first time. Think about that. Through my transition, I'd adjusted to a new relationship, gone through changes in my friendships and with my family, stepped through a very, very stressful time in my career, become confident as the real me in public, navigated what seemed to be an endless trail of legal paperwork and experienced a physical transition that was only understandable by a butterfly. Transition is not something done by clicking one's fingers. It's a long, challenging and multifaceted journey. Transition can be an opportunity and a bright future from even the darkest of starting points. Transition is a process we undertake so that we can live our lives to the fullest with authenticity. You see, my, transition, my life wasn't about transition. My transition was about life. In the past year alone, I've had high teas, done rainforest walks, gone on a speedboat joyride, driven an off-road V8 buggy, adopted a dog from the RSPCA with my partner, continued to support my World Vision child, played way too many computer games, spent way too much money at Supernova, climbed Mount Warning, I've gone on business trips around the country, I've been getting drunk in the Hunter Valley, high ropes course, I went bungee jumping, I found bargains at the markets that my, my partner did not want me to buy, road trips with friends and I've slept in a sleeping bag on the beach under the stars. On paper, my life is just as exciting as it used to be. But for the first time, I have been checking off these life experiences as the real me in an honest and authentic way. That was my dream and I made it. That was my transition. What a ride. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for a wonderful demonstration of the guts that's required to transition and the struggle that trans people face when really silence equals death. So thank you again. <laughs>